Uh, last June, I got a phone call from the secretary of Manchester Metropolitan University Christian Union. They said, Steve, I never met them. They said, Steve, we'd like you to come next, uh, next February, as in four weeks' time, and be our mission speaker. We're planning a whole series of events that we want to invite our friends along to so they can hear the gospel and decide for themselves whether to trust the Lord Jesus. Will you come and be our main speaker? And I said, yes, on one condition. The condition is that I can speak at the first meeting you have in the autumn, that I can be the speaker at your house party, and that I can do your carol service in December, and I can come back just after Christmas and speak to you again about the gospel. Now why would I say that to them? Is it that I like the sound of my own voice? Well that may or may not be true, but that wasn't the reason I said that. Is it because I like torturing people? Again, that may or may not be true, but that wasn't the reason that I gave that condition. Uh, no, I said, I said that to them, because if I just turned up in four weeks' time, which I'm going to, if I just turned up and that was the first they'd seen of me, it just would not work. It wouldn't work for two reasons. First of all, they wouldn't know and trust me. So if they've got events that they're going to be bringing their friends to, they've got to do the nerve-wracking thing of asking somebody to come to hear the gospel message. They don't want any joker or clown turning up who's a freak. If they've never known me and haven't seen me, if they haven't heard the gospel that I explain to them, how do they know that I'm going to do what they've been hoping and praying will happen, which is their friends will come and hear the gospel? But there's another reason as well. They may not trust me, but I might not trust them. For all I know, they could be a groping bunch of screaming tree huggers. That's our gospel. Go and be nice to the environment or something like that. How do I know that the gospel that I'm, I'm going to be preaching is actually the gospel they're going to be telling people to listen to? You see, it wouldn't work unless beforehand I have gospeled them. So I went in September, and I went to their house party in October, and I did their Christmas carol service for them. I'll be going back in a week or so, then I'll be going back again. And what will I be doing each time I do? And this might sound mad to you, I'll tell you what I'll be doing. I'll be gospeling the Christians. I will be evangelising Christians so that they know the gospel. What is it ultimately that will get them to bring their friends along? Is it because they've had a training course and this is how you speak about Jesus? Well, that might help. But the thing that will bring people along, that will get people to bring others along and pray for them, or even open the Bible with them themselves, is because they're full of the gospel and they love the Lord Jesus. Isn't that the thing that drives us out? Oh, I need training. Well, if, you, if you're full of it in your heart, you'll just get out. Do we need training? Of course we do. I'm rubbish in training. But it's the gospel that we all need. And isn't that encouraging to know that you never graduate in a Christian life past the gospel? So here's Paul. And he's about to head off to Rome, and two steps behind, me is the, uh, behind him is the same thing that always follows Paul wherever he goes. Trouble. He's going there, we're told, in both the uh, beginning of the Gospel, in chapter 15 and 16, he lays out his travel plans, he's off to Rome, and he's going to do Gospel work there, and he wants to go from there onto Spain, and he wants this church to do it, to help him. So rather than visit in advance, what he does is he sends them a letter to strengthen them in the gospel. So they will know what gospel he stands for, and so that when he comes, and the temperature is turned up, and the going gets tough, they will not be ashamed, because they've got the gospel. In fact, in just a few verses, he's going to say to them, I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it's the power of God for salvation. How do you get that unashamedness? Is it by sitting in church? Just, I won't be ashamed, I won't be ashamed, I won't be ashamed. No! It's by hearing the gospel. And then you don't need to be ashamed of it because it's the power of God for salvation. Now I've used this word gospel, haven't I? So let, let, me, just, let me just backtrack. What do I mean by gospel? Okay? What does the word gospel mean? Nearly. Gospel means good news. We've tagged on the good, the good bit. Actually, gospel is from the word evangel, which just means news. And more specifically, monumental announcements. If it was something like this was being announced in the modern day, CNN and Sky News would have their helicopters there, they'd have their big station with the aerials going up in the air, it would be just like that. Monumental news. The word gospel or evangel, it comes from, well it was used in the ancient world for when, say, a king had won a mighty victory with his armies for the defence and the good of his people. And he'd take his, you know, Johnny Little Clipboard, that's my phrase of the week, Johnny Clipboard. He'd take his Johnny Clipboard, bung him on a horse and say, off you go to all of the towns around and gospel them. 
evangel them. Make this monumental news broadcast of what it is that has been done for you by the mighty king. That's what gospel means. That's good news. It would be front page news. And that's why it's a good news. I want you to get this, don't miss this bit. It is not good advice about something you should do. That's not good news, is it? You and me, every day we have a list of people telling us good things that we should do, and I'm thankful for good advice. But good advice is rarely good news, is it? But good news is about what has already been done for you. Other religions are all about good advice. They'll tell you what you need to do, or where you need to go, or how you need to act if you want to get right with God, or know something about God. They'll give you lots of good advice, but you have to do it. I would not want to have to go to a mosque every week and find out where I've messed up and what I've got to do to get right with God. I just want it, wouldn't want to go after a while. Good advice doesn't help me. It just shows me where I'm going wrong. So it's not gospel that. Only Christianity is good news. Only Christianity is gospel because it is what has been done for you by God. That's good news, isn't it? And that's why this hour, and this is nuts, isn't it? We struggle sometimes to get to church on a, on a, third, on a Sunday morning. We, we, we don't make going to the other things in the week where we gather together to look at this gospel a priority. We're absolute lunatics for that reason. Because every other part of life is about good advice. Do this, figure this, pull your socks, do whatever. The only place you can go for a rest is this gospel. Is the fact that something has been done I don't know why we don't queue up at the door from 9 o'clock in the morning to hear of a rescue, something done for us. This should be the best hour of our week. Every other hour is just good advice. And yet we drift towards what other people think out there, that the Christian message at the heart of it is, well, love your neighbour, pray, be kind, speak properly, do good. And all of those things are good advice, aren't they? I'm not going to knock that. Those are all good things to do. They're not good news. This is good news. The gospel of God. This is what we need. So having said that, we're going to look at the content, or we're going to look at the gospel, okay? We're looking at it under three headings. Now, Proby. That's not as clear as it was on my computer. Oh well. Okay? We're not going to see the three headings, fair enough. Uh, If you can dabble with it, Oh, don't worry, I'll just... Every, yeah, don't worry, we'll nail it. Three headings. The first one is the gospel, its source. It's an announcement from God. Second of all, its centre. It's about Jesus Christ. And third of all, its scope. It's for all people. So we're going to try something, and I know we don't like participation here, but we're going to do it, okay. God's announcement about Jesus Christ for all people. Do you think you can get that? It's brilliant the way I've made that fit together, isn't it? Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to say it together so it sticks in our brain. Are we ready? God's a now... Oh, dear, no. We've got to try harder than that. If I'm standing here shouting, the least you can do is meet me not even halfway. Part of the way, ready? God's announcement about Jesus Christ for all people. Poor Mark's like, I need some contacts. <laughs> Great, okay? Do it by memory, not by looking, okay? Ready? We'll try one more time, okay? God's announcement about Jesus Christ for all people. So if somebody stops you in the street and says, you have one sentence to tell me everything I need to know about the Christian faith, what would you say? You would say... Woohoo! Virtual revival. Brilliant. Let's go to the point number one. It's source, God's announcement. It is God's message we find in verses 1 and 2. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an, uh, an apostle, which is a sent one, like a herald on the horse, and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. This is God's message. This is not Paul's message, it is God's message. It is not Steve's message on a Sunday morning, it is God's message. Trends come and go. I've noticed this when it comes, I've probably told you about this before, but with the babies, and you get different advice. I've had five babies we've had, 
The first one we've told sleep on your front, next one sleep on your back, next one sleep on your front, and I don't which one are we up to at the moment? What are we supposed to be doing with the baby? On the back at the moment, apparently. And you're told that if you don't do the right one, the baby will, will die horribly and suddenly in the night. And we've done it differently every time, and guess what? They're all still just about there. Just, okay? And it could be about the, 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 modern, uh, the modern thinking and the modern wisdom on, on when you start weaning your baby and giving them solids. What did we start off? Was it three or four months we started off at? Four months? And what are we at now? Six months, okay? Has it made a squatter difference? No, because it's just man-made wisdom. It doesn't matter. Trends come and go. We can't make up our minds. Not so with God and his gospel. This is God's gospel. It is unchangeable. It is set. It is his. We might want to change his gospel because it makes us feel uncomfortable. We might not like bits of it, but we can't. We cannot tamper with it, mess with it, alter it, trivialise it or minimise it. This is God's message, his announcements. And that means something very important. We have no right to not make it exactly what it is. Uh, it's one of the reasons we have the Bible open on your laps. You can see it sitting there. Why is that? Because we... Well, I'll tell you why it's there. It's so that you can check that what I say is actually God's words. This is God speaking to you when you open the Bible. It's his announcement to you. It's not Steve standing up here because he's got nothing better to do the rest of the week. It is God addressing you and me. It means we cannot change it. And this is one of the ways in which we're different to, say, a Catholic church. They, they agree that there is some sort of apostolic authority, and they suggest that uh, from Peter and Paul, who were the first apostles, that that apostolic authority is passed down from person to person. So just as the first apostles were appointed, as Paul was here, to speak for God, they say that is passed on, to different apostles, they have a right and they can change the message if they feel that that's what God is saying to them. Now we believe in apostolic succession, but we think that the, the, the Catholic teaching, the official doctrine, is wrong because actually it's the original message that was given to Paul that is unchanging, and we have that apostolic authority with us whether through a living successor, no through the writings, through what you've got sitting on your lap it is that same message, once delivered to the Apostle Paul, that is unchangeable. It doesn't change with a new generation. It is the same gospel message given by God through Paul to us, sitting on your lap. And I'll tell you what, it's exciting. That's why we have our Bibles open. And it's worth noticing that the, that, that the Lord loves this. It's something that's very important. You can tell how important something is to somebody by how well they prepare for it. This is God's gospel, and he has rolled out the red carpet. I don't, it says in the Bible that the Lord God of heaven and earth neither, uh, neither sleeps nor slumbers. But it would be fair to say that if God did catch 40 wings, the thing that would get him up in the morning is this message. This is what floats his boat. This is what energizes him. This is what he is working towards. This is his plan. This is... The joy of his heart, this message, that's really what makes him tick. And it's so precious to him. I was watching Take That Demo, uh, uh, documentaries over Christmas. It seems as if they, Christmas is a good time to rerun re the documentary of how it all went right for Take That, despite the ten, ten, years in the, oh, ten years in the wilderness. How did I cope? I don't know. And uh, this is how it all went right for Take That. And you remember, you know, the little screaming fans in the early to mid-90s who, like, uh, they'd come back from, um, you know, they'd, they'd stalked the bands to get backstage so they can watch just before the band. Oh, they're not even a band, are they? They play a group, okay, before they go up and do their concert. And, and on the way in, one of them had, like, managed to grab the mug that Jason Orange had been drinking out of and they'd come running back and the camera would snap it and, and there's this like little spotty faced teenager jumping around a little bit like Fiona when she goes see the Jonas Brothers and jumping around with, with the mug and she shouts this belonged to Jason Orange I'm not going to tell me friends and they got out the big bricks because that's all they had back then with a big mobile phone listen guess what I've got it didn't occur to that dweeby teenager to be ashamed of that mug because of who it belonged to. Wouldn't that be great if it was the same for us with God's gospel? 
You know, if we'd got Jason Oranges, maybe we wouldn't be excited, but that teenager wouldn't be able to wait as people come in the door. Guess what I've got? Wouldn't it be great if we were like that with God's gospel? Because of who it belonged to. It is so precious. He rolled out the good red carpet. You can see him telling about that. The, the gospel he promised beforehand through the prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Paul is going round. Now this is important. I need to, this is a technical point already. Don't phase out. This is important so you can understand Romans in the future. Paul would go around telling people about Jesus and saying it is purely on the grounds of what Jesus Christ has done for you that you are put right with God. It is by trusting in faith in the achievements of Jesus Christ, dying in your place, being good enough for you that you are put right with God. It is 100% him, 0% you. And then a little while later we find in the New Testament that other people would come from a more Jewish background who love their Old Testaments, just like Paul loved the Old Testament. And they'd say, you know that Paul? He's got the message wonky. In fact, as I read my Old Testament, it tells me that, um, well, you've got to be holy. That's when God will accept you. You've got to obey. Um, You've got to be circumcised. You've got to go through certain rituals. And that's how you will be made acceptable with God. And Paul says, no. You've got the Old Testament wrong. And so through the book of Romans, he's not just strengthening them in the gospel. He's showing that he hasn't binned off the Old Testament. That actually this gospel he is proclaiming is the one that they should have read and should have seen when they looked in their Old Testament, but didn't. And he's showing how, I mean he quotes it all the way through, we're going to have great fun in chapter 4, in chapter 7, in chapters 9 through to 11, of how it is that this wonderful gospel was promised in the Old Testament and is now coming to fruition. Now that is how serious it is. It is God's gospel. It's God's message. So fundamentally, Romans isn't interested in me, what I want and what I do. He says, oh, Steve, you're really selling it to us now. No, no, let me tell you this. Romans is interested in God, what he wants and what he does. He is the main character. All lights and all eyes are on him. And can I tell you this? It's wonderful. It's wonderful. That's its source, God's announcement. Secondly, it's centre. It's about Jesus Christ. Now, Bethany got a history book. Was it Becky? One of the two of them. They got like a little history book. You know, the, the picture history books you can get. 250, 300 pages of history, something like that. And I always get to scan through their world history books just to see what, what the author thinks are the big turning points in history. And of the 250, 300 pages, in a tiny little column, in a tiny little corner, I didn't hear anything about Jesus... But I heard that there was the spread of Christianity. And at that point, I just grabbed the book, shook it, I think in the view of my kids, and said, Are you blind? Those sort of things get me angry. We're standing on the heritage of Jesus Christ. The the international law is governed by his words and his commands. The Judeo-Christian ethic has shaped virtually everything in the way that the world is done. The reason that we are reading today, and not like apes hanging from the tree, is because of the fact that Christianity has advocated and developed the use of language, education, universities. It wasn't the Muslims who developed that. They pinched that off the Christians. It was the believers in Jesus Christ who wanted to say, read and know this gospel. He is the turning point of human history. I feel quite strongly about this one. Is that alright? Oh, I get angry when he gets demeaned and made small. Because he's not. This is a gospel because at the centre of human history and God's purposes for the world are his son. Look at it there in verse 3. Regarding or concerning his son. Let me uh, go back a little bit. By the way, verses 1 to 7 is one sentence in the original Greek. Have fun with that. Uh, The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophet in the Holy Scriptures regarding or concerning his son, who as to his human nature was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. In the Old Testament, something was being told and promised about this Son, God the Son. So in Psalm 2, we're told that he will have dominion. He will be God's Son, and he will rule over the nations. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, we are told that a king will come out of the Davidic line 
who will rule forever and whose kingdom will have no end. Now all the Davidic kings, they reigned for a bit, but they kept failing because they kept dying. But we were being told that one would come who would, whose reign would extend beyond death and would last forever. Psalm 110. We're told that this king in his enthronement psalm would actually be God himself and he would have volunteer forces on the day of battle. In other words, his troops would be willing, they'd want to follow him and go after him. He would be the great son. And so we see here that verse 3 has come true regarding his son who as to his human nature was a descendant of David. But who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. See, both verse 3 and verse 4 tell us that he's the Messiah. But the first one, verse 3, shows the human nature of his ministry. That he is the son of David who was a, who was a great and mighty king who suffered for the good and well-being and the leading of God's people. He was a suffering Messiah. But verse 4 shows us an enthroned king. And who through, and it's almost like one neat phrase in the original language, tell, uh, the Greek people tell me, that who through the spirit of holiness was declared son of God in power. Like one word, son of God in power. That word declared or, or marked out was something that he was always, he is shown to be. In other words, he has always been God the son. But God the Son became the Son of God, heir of David, and was marked out by his resurrection as God the Son, Son of God in power, mighty, the promised king whose dominion would have absolutely no end. Let's just track this one back again, because I don't want you to miss it, okay? God the Son became the Son of God in Jesus Christ, and his life and his death. But in resurrection, he was marked out, not just as another one of David's sons, who reigned for a bit and died, but as the Son, God the Son, who would rule in power. So what's the turning point in history? Well, that dude who wrote that history book got it wrong. We might be tempted to say it was the life of Jesus. We might be tempted to say it was the death of Jesus. But it seems that it's the resurrection of Jesus. true historical fact, and this is why we have so much confidence, is that the resurrection marks Jesus out. He is the rightful king because he rules from his throne in heaven. Because of his actual historical, really actually happened resurrection. He is the rightful king. He can be our judge because he is alive and unavoidable. He can be our saviour because it shows that the cross has worked. That him dying in our place and paying the penalty for our sin has achieved what it intended for he has risen from the grave. Summed up for us, thank you the Apostle Paul because we're slow. Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus the saviour. Christ the king. Lord the judge. Three words. Why don't you go away from here today? find somebody because somebody will ask you how did your weekend go they will whether it's on the phone or at the school gate or in the office or whatever it is they'll ask you and you can say do you know what it was special this weekend because I learned more about Jesus Christ the Lord any of us could say that they'll look at you and think you're bonkers but you don't need to be ashamed because it's true and it's awesome How wonderful. But the question comes, is he your Lord? Have you noticed, we can't actually make him Lord, because he is the Lord, yeah? It's a reality. We can deny it, which many people do. We can hide from it. I not come and listen to it. For a while, we can get away from that, and he will allow us to that. But sooner or later, you will meet him, and your folly at running from him will be exposed. Why? Because he is the Lord. You can't make him Lord. He is the Lord, but this is the great bit. You can make him your Lord. Isn't that what a believer is? We make him your, our Lord. And this was the fulfilment of the Old Testament promise, wasn't it? Remember, we've got to realise, let me go back and show you this problem that Paul was dealing with. The Old Testament was a book of promises. A promise of salvation. 
In fact, elsewhere in the New Testament, Paul says that these scriptures are there and they can make you wise to salvation. He doesn't say they can make you wise, but it has to be good. They can make you wise to the fact that you need a rescuer to put you right with God. And this is where the critics had got it wrong. So the Jewish critics had read the book and so, uh, the Old Testament, some of which were laws, some of which were promises. And what they'd done is they'd read it merely as a law book. And the basic assumption was, what, how do you respond to a law book? Answer, you obey it. And they made it sound as if it was possible to obey, which isn't true. You and I don't need to look in the mirror for very long before we realise that no matter how hard we try, we'll never be good enough. And they made it sound as if the way to get right with God is to do the um, obedience thing, and that's not true. Now what Paul is saying here is that we need a saving king, a Lord. And until you've spotted that, you haven't read your Old Testament right. That's one of the exciting things. As we go through Romans, it will teach us how to read the Old Testament. Some of you are like, whoa, I don't get this. Well, Paul's going to tell us basically straight up, it's all about Jesus. Getting ready for what it means to follow him. We need Jesus Christ, our Lord. Yep, I'll leave that bit out because we're going to ask that. Let's move on to the last point. Okay, we have seen so far that its source is God's announcement, God himself. Its centre is Jesus Christ, our Lord. And its scope, okay, well it's for all people. Let's read verses 5 and 6. Through him and for his name's sake we receive grace and apostleship to call people from among all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. And you also are among those who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's totally inclusive this, isn't it? Some people have this view of Christianity, oh, you're very narrow. You say this, this and this. It's not totally inclusive. This is for all people. So whether you're an atheist or a Jew, a Buddhist or Muslim, a successful or failure, poor, wealthy, loud, quiet, old, young, married, single, fat, thin, all people, whoever you are, God's intention is that the herald sooner or later will come to you and make this monumental announcement of what God has done. Guess who the herald of the Apostle Paul might be? Let me mirror when I need it. Who are you going to clickety clop along to? Who are you right now you're really scared about doing it with? He's calling us to be the herald and take it to all nations. But it's for absolutely everybody. And you look out at some of the people you know, you say, well, they've got it all together. I tell you what, when they stand before that Lord, they won't look like they've got it all together. So tell them now if you love them. Tell them now before it's too late. And what do you tell them to do about this wonderful announcement from God about Jesus Christ? Well, it tells us there, through him and for his name's sake, we receive grace and apostleship to call people from among all the Gentiles, that's the nations, to do what? Obey? Well, let's have a look. To the obedience that comes from faith. Literally, the obedience of faith. Stay out of that to the Old Testament, well, I'll tell you. It's a new kind of obedience. It's not one that's born out of fear. Obey me or else. It's not one that is enforced. Do it or you're squished. That's not the kind of faith or obedience that's on show here. That's a kind of obedience. Tragically, it's the one that we use with our kids far too often. What we do is we make them conform rather than winning their hearts. And there's a big difference. We know that, don't we? Hmm? So you can get a kid to, ch- to sit still in church, but it's a whole different ball game about giving them the desire to sit still, isn't it? And it could be the same about the way they use the language or the way they talk to you or whatever it is. One is an obedience that is born out of got to do it, been forced. One, dare I say, is an obedience of faith. The one that is born out of faith here, look at it, look at the kind of obedience, look at what drives this kind of obedience, look at the words here. So as we go through, there's the word received grace, called, belonging, loved, and peace. Those are the things that create obedience of faith. 
And as you reach out to God, and as you put your faith in him for your salvation, as you, as you see, you begin to be changed through your faith. You receive from him. You, you sense a call. There's, a, there's the outward call of the scripture. So as I speak the message out to you, there's an outward call, but inside you feel an inward tug. You're attracted to it. You're drawn to it. You don't know all of it, but you know enough to know this is something I need. And that's God calling. As that happens to you, as you're attracted. You, you want to belong to his people. You want to revel in the fact that you are loved by him. And there's a peace, not like a oh, peace because you've been smoking weed, a peace that means there's an end of the cessation of violence and brokenness. There's a restoration there. And as all of those things interact upon you through your faith, it doesn't leave you the same, does it? You've changed. You want more of it. You start to love what it's about. You get an obedience of faith. You want to obey. Yes, you fail, and when you fail, it grieves you. You look at how undeserving you are, and it hurts you. But you want it. That's the obedience of faith. God is not a mean guy in the sky saying, do what I say or else. He's a lover who through his grace, who through his calling, through giving you something to belong to, through his love, through his peace, woos you near and says, I need that, I want that. I want to change. I want to listen in church. Where'd that come from? You know you're loved, not because of your character, and yet as you come near to him, your character changes, doesn't it? You have an obedience from faith. If you're called, you long for it, you want to please the one who did this. And in a minute, well next week, you're going to look at that famous verse, verse 16, which says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. You see that? And uh, that's a verse, by the way, you want to go away and learn, verse 16. You need to get this. He's not saying that the gospel brings a power. He's not saying that the gospel is the means to a power. A bit like all of the religions, you know, this is the way that you'll get power. This is the, the means to get power. He's not saying that. What is he saying? He's saying, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power. This message from God, this announcement about who Jesus is and what he does in us and how he has loved us and how he's forgiven us and how he makes us new and how knowing the worst about us, he's done all of this for us, that is the power. Uh, the degree to which you grab a hold of it, look on it, meditate on it, let it shape your thinking, drill it down deep, push it in, have it pulsing through your veins, live it. That degree is to the degree to which you taste his power. The more you push it into you, the more you'll have an obedience of faith, the more you'll know his grace, the more you won't be ashamed anymore. In fact, being ashamed of this message will just become ludicrous to you. This is the message on which I stand. Look! Better than a mug from Jason Orange. This is my hope. This is from my God. This is the gospel. This is the power of God of which I am not ashamed. So this week, as I close, this week... Please get this. You don't need to be ashamed. Have you taken the gospel and jammed it in? That's why we tell you and encourage you, read the Bible every day. Not so you can learn what to do, so that you can take hold of this gospel, jam it into you. I am saved by Jesus and nothing else alone. That's why we pray. We seek after it and say, Lord, push this gospel. Get it into me. That's why we gather, to encourage one another. Not to do better, because to be honest with you, on our own, we can't. We just can't. But we can take that gospel in and let it reshape us and reform us. That's why we do what we do at church. We don't need to be ashamed. It's good news. It's not good advice. It's from God and it is proven. It's about Jesus, the Saviour. And it has power for all people to change. Why? Well, for the glory of his name's sake. So at the end of the day... All the nations are left praising him because only he can do what he can do. Take it in. Don't be ashamed. Pray for somebody this week. Say, Lord, I'm not at the point where I can speak, but I want to be. Get me ready for that day. Help me to invite somebody. I've learned and I've tasted that Jesus really is King, Saviour, Judge and Lord and he's done all these things for me. I'm not ashamed. 
we're going to stand and sing together now. I'm going to have to come down off here because I'm going to have to go playing the guitar. This song is all about the fact that Jesus is mighty to save and it is 